Hi everyone and welcome to NBTV. We are coming to you from a different show time today. Exciting time, but it is Privacy Beat, our regular Thursday show where we bring you all the latest and greatest in privacy. We help keep you updated on all the tools that you need to keep yourself private in the internet world. And we call this segment, Get Off My Digital Lawn. Get off my digital lawn. All right, so today we are going to be talking about Apple telling governments around the world, get off my digital lawn. We're going to be diving into some legislation coming out of the EU and out of the USA that could threaten privacy for Apple users. So we'll dive into all of those details. As always, keep an eye on the bottom of the screen there. You will see some quiz questions pop up during the show. Make sure you post your answers in the chat and we'll be choosing a winner who gets the uh, all three answers of the quiz questions correct. These winners will receive eternal glory. So make sure that you're setting in your answers. Let's dive straight into it. So this week, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, he gave a speech at the IAPP conference in Washington, DC, and he dove into how privacy for Apple users may be under threat. A couple of pieces of legislation, uh, both sides of the Atlantic, it could possibly force Apple to lose their grip on the iOS walled garden that they have set up there. So the two pieces of legislation we'll dive into first, we've got the Open App Markets uh, Act introduced to the US last year, and then we've got the European Union's Digital Markets Act. So both of these are getting some traction and uh, pretty disastrous bills. Let's, let's talk about them. First of all, Digital Markets Act bill. Let's pull that up on screen. So this was pro a proposed system where a subset of key internet players will be deemed gatekeepers on the internet and they will be required to abide by specific additional conditions. So the overarching goal of this bill was to foster competition and that's sort of the theme in a lot of these. We're talking antitrust, we're talking about how do we stop Apple having this stranglehold over their ecosystem and how do we allow fair competition? Sort of the guys that these politicians are using for these bills. So this one says that you know, we don't want a winner takes all dynamic and all of this. So they're going to put pra like limits in practice on certain tech companies when it comes to like self preferencing, when it comes to data use, and when it comes to requirements to support interoperability. So this act will give extra oblig obligations to large players with significant market power. They're talking about platforms, for example, that have 45 million active users plus per month. Obviously, that includes Apple. And uh, these tech companies will now be considered gatekeepers. And so they're basically demanding interoperability and certain standards and all of that we'll dive into a bit more in a second um and it is interesting because when you talk about like not allowing something to be a gatekeeper apple to be a gatekeeper a lot of people use apple products because they like that apple is the gatekeeper that they're sort of this filter system that keeps out all of the crud and you know it leaves you with this very polished very secure product so uh, it's kind of the difference between apple and google there the android phones where you can have everything on there and it's notorious for being less secure than the apple ecosystem but now lawmakers are saying actually apple we want other things to be in your app store we want to open this up so that you no longer have control over this system you have to let other things be interoperable with your devices a lot of issues there that we'll dive into the second uh, bill that i want to mention the open app markets act so uh this is a bill that would require companies that control operating systems to allow third-party apps and uh, app stores. So a very similar thing, you know, competition, let's open up these systems. There's actually, in, in this vein, there's ongoing litigation already between Apple and uh, Epic Games. So Epic Games, they are, of course, um, a very well-known game producer. They create Fortnite. Um, so we'll dive into that, those details in a moment as well. But essentially, Apple at this conference, you had Tim Cook saying how Apple believes that privacy is a fundamental human right. He said that, you know, the um, there is this data industrial complex built uh, on a foundation of surveillance currently, and Apple is really trying their best to combat it. And in order to combat it, they need to control what's out there because all sorts of like malware or of privacy breaching apps could slip through the cracks if they're not controlling this system. So here is a bite from Tim Cook where he's sort of just talking about how Apple 
really prioritizes privacy in that ecosystem. Let's go ahead and play that one. The fight to protect privacy is not an easy one, but it is one of the most essential battles of our time. And we at Apple are proud to stand alongside all those who are working to advance privacy rights around the world. So they have done a really good job with this. Let's be honest. So recent years, especially, they've had a continued push towards privacy. They've introduced app tracking transparency. So they have these pop-ups appear now when you use apps that say, do you want to allow this app to track you? And it's basically giving users a choice that we can debate about the efficacy of this. It's more like an honor system than a tight control. But it was enough to actually lose tech companies a huge amount of money in data brokerage, essentially. So um, they also have, you know, privacy relay, which is sort of a built-in tour system that they use for protect people's IP addresses, which is pretty cool. They had an email address shielding feature that they launched, which makes it harder for third parties to link users' web activity across different services. They really, I mean, Apple does a lot for privacy. Again, we can debate uh, about the efficacy, but they push that narrative and they remind us of how important digital privacy is. So my I had, you know, it does go off to them, even though they have lost some trust in the community recently with they're doing, but their orders of magnitude better than what Google is doing, which is just actively, you know, collecting as much data as they can from people to use for advertising. So this, uh, this idea that, uh, you know, security is so important in their ecosystem because it bolsters your privacy. It allows you them to control track you and monitor you, et cetera. Um, there are some critics who are saying that, you know, security is, uh, isn't actually going to be changed by giving people more control over the choice of third party software that they can download. So we'll talk about the other side of things as well. But there are basically three areas of this issue that I want to cover. The first one is the idea that this is going to hurt users security and privacy. Opening up this ecosystem is actually going to hurt the end user. So let's dive into that first. Now, the reasoning behind this is that you're basically forcing Apple to sidestep these rigorous security protections that they have put in place, where they're very tightly controlling their ecosystem. If they're allowed to just let anyone come in and build apps and put them on their, their app store, then they, they would basically be relinquishing that control, but also relinquishing that um, you know tight security control that they have over things as well, that they've sort of baked into the app store. And Tim Cook talked about that in his speech this week. He said in particular, he said, I fear that we could soon lose the ability to provide some of those protections. He said, if, if data hungry companies would be able to avoid our privacy rules, they could once again track our users against their will. He also says that he is, uh, and Apple is deeply concerned about regulations that would undermine privacy and security uh, in service of some other aim. So that's all so the trade-off that we've got right now. We've got legislators saying, well, in the interests of fairness and competition and all this, we want to enact these policies. And Apple is saying those policies, while they are in pursuit of these other aims, they would be to the detriment of users' privacy and security, because opening up a system obviously would open that up to uh, things that they were outside of their control. So they couldn't have this uh, tight privacy and security controls on their system. Now, this, you know, as I said, it would potentially give bad actors a way around their com comprehensive security protections. It would put them in direct contact with users as well, rather than having Apple as this sort of broker or middleman. It's exactly what governments don't want. They don't want Apple being these gatekeepers, but it's exactly what sort of provides these security protections there. Um, now, let's dive into this idea that actually this legislation could have the opposite outcome of what the legislators intended. So it could hurt users' choice. Let me explain that a little more. This move would essentially remove a more secure choice from users because currently people go to the Apple store, they go to get Apple products because they're looking for a more secure option. That's generally why people choose their products. You know, it would be less secure if these safeguards were not in place. Now, uh, Tim Cook said, proponents of these regulations argue that no harm would be done by simply giving people a choice, but taking away a more secure option will leave users with less choice, not more. 
And he said the Apple uh, letting unbedded apps into iPhones will have profound unintended consequences. He also said, you know, they need to make sure that regulations are crafted, interpreted and implemented in a manner that protects people's fundamental rights and said that regulatory shifts in competition policy uh, are a pivotal moment in the battle for privacy. And I really want to dig into this. So the idea that people would be downgraded from a premium user experience is a real thing here you know um like first of all some caveats obviously the apple store isn't perfect malware slips through all the time uh it just because they have these tight controls it doesn't mean that it's a perfectly safe environment and, and users are going to be immune from fraud and scams and all of that but they do a much better job than the google play store if you compare if you look at any of the like malware investigations that people do there are always way more malware apps and uh, bad apps in the Google Play Store than there are in the Apple Store, right? So it does do a little bit, even though it's not a perfect solution. So this whole idea is that, you know, uh, that we're taking away users' choice is because currently people have a choice. They don't have to use Apple, right? They could use Android. They could use a more open system where you can download things directly onto your device. You could use other phone providers entirely. They don't have to be using Apple. People choose Apple because they like that more security is implied and more privacy is implied. And by taking down the safeguards that Apple currently allow their users it would compromise that choice it would take it away from people so it is worth considering whether this legislation even has uh good consequences on the um on the choice side of things on that antitrust side of things so the uh the third thing that i want to to bring up is essentially like even if apple like doesn't actually completely save users from this malware even if it isn't an airtight framework that protects people at the end of the day, it's also a principal thing. So here's something that I will bring up. Maybe I'll get some pushback. So tell me in the comment section if you completely disagree with me. I feel pretty strongly about this, that Apple has the right to build into their systems what they want, right? If I build a website, I have the right to put on my website the things that I want on my website. And the idea of someone else coming in and saying, you need to let other people build things on your website. It's like, why don't they build their own website? <laughs> you know, it's the fundamental right of a creator to control the thing that they're creating. You know, if I build a physical store, if I open a, a store that sells handkerchiefs or whatever, you know, I should be able to offer products that I want to offer. And I shouldn't be forced as a provider, as a business owner, to allow other people to put things in my store that I don't want to actually sell. So I think that fundamentally, this idea that Apple created a device, I think they should get to choose what apps are allowed on that device out of principle. There are people who disagree and say, no, that's bigger than that. And there's antitrust and it's non-competitive and they have such a huge market share that obviously other people have the right to put things on their product. I think they have a huge market share because they provide a really valuable service that people like. We shouldn't discount that and we shouldn't, you know, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. They have a great airtight um, system that provides a lot more security and privacy. And let's not destroy that by forcing them to take down their safeguards in the name of competition when people are actually opting into Apple because they like the service that they have. No one's forcing anyone to use this service. So that's, that's my take there. Um, I want to touch back on this Epic, Epic Games lawsuit that I mentioned earlier. So they've sued Apple and Google actually over their App Store policies. This is the creator of uh, Fortnite. Now, Epic's lawsuit basically says that Apple wasn't entitled to the 30% cut of the in-game purchases on Fortnite that were on the Apple Store. And that's a crux of this issue here. It is a monetary issue. It's that app, um, Apple has this kind of stranglehold if people have apps in the store, they pay through Apple, and then Apple gets a cut of anything that is uh, is sold there. I, again, like I, I, I mean, if I had a store, if I was selling products, I wouldn't just allow anyone to come into my store and sell their own products inside my store that I built. Um, I would say, okay, well, you can sell your products, but I want a cut of the things that you're selling. I think it makes sense, but Epic Games didn't think so, so they're suing them. They're also suing uh, Google. 
essentially the lawsuit came about because they attempted to bypass this percentage uh, take and then Apple responded by removing Fortnite from their online store. And then Epic was like, oh my God, antitrust. And then they fought them. Uh, and then now they're fighting Google for a similar policy. We'll have to wait till 2024 to see the outcome of that trial. It'll be very interesting to see what happens there. I'm I'm not on Epic's side there. Um, I mean, I, I just to give you some context, I'm not 100% on board with Apple either. I think that a lot of their policies with the App Store, I really disagree with. I have a lot of friends who are app developers who are constantly having issues with getting their apps into the store. It is a real, it is a real issue there. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, I do think that Apple has the right, even though what they're doing is sign of bad practices, but I don't want to get I don't want to get the government involved in changing those practices. I just think that the government shouldn't have a, a role in this decision making process. So one thing I'll bring up, Inc.com had uh, an interesting take on this. They talked about how when Apple says it's their responsibility as producers and Tim Cook's talked about this in the conference earlier this week. Tim Cook was saying, well, it's our responsibility as developers to make sure that we're ensuring the safety of our systems and the security of our systems. Please let Apple just ensure that security, don't make us undermine it. Um, we have responsibility to our users. Inc.com asked the question, you know, how do you define what that responsibility is? And they said, you know, they would argue that it doesn't mean telling users what's best for them. They say that it doesn't mean controlling how their users use their device just because it's a scary world out there and they might go on the internet and bad things might happen. I'm, I'm, again, I'm just going to push back on that argument because I actually think that's exactly why people choose Apple. I think they choose Apple because these decisions are made for them, because there's less opportunity to customize. If you want to customize things, you can go on your Android and you can open it up and, and check out the code. And it, there's a whole bunch of open source stuff going you can tinker with. You can customize it till your, your heart's content. You can't do that on Apple devices, but people go to Apple because a lot of these decisions are made for them because there are lots of default options and they're great options. It's a polished product. People don't have to tinker with. They just know that they call it product. So I think that because Apple goes out of their way to protect users from their decisions is actually a, a, a selling point for a lot of users. A lot of people want that. You know, there's, there's this thing that Mac does on their computers. If you download an app from someone's website rather than going through the Apple store on your computer, which you can on the phone, you can't bypass that. But on your computer, you can download directly any software that you want. Now, when you open it for the first time, you'll notice a little pop up comes up as you downloaded this from the internet. Are you sure you want to open it? It's interesting because it's a tiny little pop up. And generally we go, yes, I do. I just downloaded it. Of course, I, of course I want to open it. But this has actually made a huge difference in reducing the amount of malware people put onto their devices. Just that simple act of asking, reminding people, hey, this is from the internet, we haven't vetted it, do you want to open it? It's made a huge difference in malware on people's computers. So it's interesting, you know, they're, you could say they're trying to protect people from their own choices, and yet they're doing uh, some great thing there just by putting that pop-up there, reminding people, and people at the end of the day can still choose. Another thing that they've done is the do not track pop-ups on your phone. When you're using your phone, you open an app, uh, you'll get a pop up and it says this app wants to track you. Do you want to let it? Now, technically, people should already know that that app wants to track them, right? People should be reading the privacy policy of the apps that they install on their phones. People should be reading the permissions that they grant to these apps when they first install them. Turns out people don't really do this. So this simple act of just putting up a pop up that says, hey, just a reminder, this app wants to track you. Do you actually want to let that happen? It turns out that that's made a huge difference in privacy, even though it is just like an honor system. But apparently this has cost social media platforms upwards of $10 billion. So an investigation by the Financial Times last year found that Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube lost around $10 billion in revenue after these changes to Apple's privacy policy. So people do like uh, Apple products. They do like these little warnings and they do like them kind of guiding people and saying, hey, this is a better privacy practice practice use this thing. And regulators are coming in and saying, well, for this completely different reason, we want to undermine that. So it's like an interesting situation there because I I'm generally someone you you might be like, Naomi, that surprises me that you feel that way. Because I'm generally someone who says, you know, I don't want other people to like nanny others. 
but there's a big caveat there. I don't, I don't like people nannying others by force. I don't like government coming in and making rules protecting people from their own decisions by force when there's no choice. The difference here is that you can choose whether or not you want to use Apple products and people are opting into it, right? Um, if you don't want to use the products, if you don't want them to nanny you or put these guidelines in place or put these pop-ups in place or filter things in the app store, you can use other products. There are so many out there. And it's strange to me that legislators want to make Apple just like every other product out there on the market is my two cents there. There is another piece of legislation that I do want to dive into. Again, it has to do with like this antitrust uh, stuff. It, 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 Forbes wrote a, about it. Um, they're talking about encryption back doors. So talking about why it, it, Europe's radical DNA um, is hitting these messaging apps pretty hard. So I want to just quickly dive into this last piece of legislation. There is the idea that the EU wants messaging apps all to be interoperable, again, in the name of fair competition and antitrust and not letting any of the big players have too much of a market share. So I think it was last week they agreed that the largest messaging services will now have to open up and interoperate with smaller mes messaging platforms if they so request. So what does that actually entail, right? So in theory, it would allow something like Google Messenger or Signal or Threema or whatever else you're using to exchange messages, to send files or make video calls with someone on WhatsApp, right? On Facebook Messenger, on iMessenger. It would, it would force compatibility with all of these things. I was like, why, why, why are we forcing these companies to be interoperable? I, it, it's strange. And uh, again, it's in the name of fairness and all of this. Um, what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequences of this are disastrous. And I'm actually going to dive into this bill at a later date because there's still work to be done on you know getting this voted on and all the details. So we'll dive into it. But basically, I want to give you a quick overview now. Um, it would force WhatsApp, Apple, Google, all these companies to open up their end-to-end -end encryption. And uh, they would say, you know, to, to do this without compromising its security is almost impossible, is basically to, to summarize all of this. If you want things to be interoperable, it can be made to work, but it will weaken the architecture of these systems. So if you have something like Signal with this end-to-end -end encryption, you're basically, creating this protocol that is compatible with people who have this app on their devices and it means the signal can't access any of the messages that you send no one can access the messages you send except you and the person receiving it right it's a very airtight system and what they're saying is that this airtight system now has to be compatible with some protocol which may not be the same protocol that some other company is using and like how do you ensure that you're all using the same protocol there so what Forbes explained in their article, they said that from an encrypted content perspective, any solution we're operating on device or, or somewhere in the ether would need to de decrypt and recrypt content from one platform standard to another. So let me rephrase that. If you have one protocol that let's say Signal is using, and let's say WhatsApp's using a completely different protocol and Telegram's using another one and iMessage is using another one. You would have to have a way to like translate those things. So suddenly you open up these systems to all of this caveats and, and like whatever the security level of these systems, you can no longer say that it's end-to-end -end encrypted because all these things are happening in the middle to change that compatibility and make things work and, and operate with each other. So it's this really bad situation where you no longer have an airtight system of this protocol on signal everyone's using it it's airtight only the sender and receiver can can see this suddenly you've got like middlemen and bridges where who knows what kind of holds are there for people to access and actually get access to your messages it completely undermines the end-to-end -end encryption of these platforms and the EU has been trying to do this for a long time. The US has been trying to do this for a long time. All of these politicians want to undermine end-to-end -end encryption. And now they're using antitrust and competition as an excuse to dive into this world. So it's, it's pretty scary. Um, it's also happening alarmingly quickly. This could be rolled out as early as 2023. So next year. So the EU said that once the legal text is finalized and approved, it will be published and come into force 20 days later. What? 
and the rules will apply six months after that. So we're talking about a really quick time frame. They kind of threw this one in and were like, yeah, let's speed roll this without opportunity for pushback from the community. It is kind of a disaster, which is why I want to do a whole show on it later and really dive into the nitty gritty and the technical details of why this is such a, a disaster. But just to kind of summarize all the stuff we've talked about in today's show, in the name of you know fairness and competition, you've got politicians making rules about tech that they don't understand and they're hurting privacy and security in the process and this is definitely something that we should be speaking up about this is definitely something we should be push, pushing back against the government shouldn't be getting involved with these these practices especially when they don't understand the tech itself it's a, kind of a scary area and for a lot of these politicians they have an ulterior agenda which is undermining end-to-end -end encryption so just a lot of stuff to be aware of there, a lot of stuff to be aware of when politicians put forward this legislation in the name of things that sound really good. Generally, there is some sort of agenda belying it and uh, and we need to be aware of that before we vote on something that just sounds good because the unintended consequences of these things could be absolutely devastating for privacy. That's what it's looking at like right now. And I actually asked people on Twitter about this um, and I, I specifically wanted to know what they thought about Apple and their privacy because Apple, I mean, I, I talked about both sides of Apple's policies, how a lot of the things they're doing, it's kind of an honor system, right? So I asked the question to Twitter. I said, um, you know, how good is Apple on privacy? Some say that they've done much more to further the privacy conversation than anyone. And then others say that they're just another big tech company that can't be trusted. I asked people where they stood. Um, and uh, actually, most people said they're unsure. 48% <laughs> said they, they're not sure where they stand on Apple privacy. 26% said they hate them for the privacy. They just don't think they're any good. Maybe they collect too much data. Maybe they're not as good as they say they are. Maybe it's all an illusion. 24% uh, said that they love them for their privacy. So that's like a good quarter uh, of the participants in this poll say that they really like what Apple is doing for privacy. So a very interesting uh, couple of tweets that I want to highlight. So we had Tar Taria, is that how you pronounce it? Morgado said that they've done great things, but as long as iCloud isn't encrypted, it all feels pointless. P.S. A very big chunk of apps use iCloud's cloud kit framework and its privacy, private and or public database. It's not only Apple apps. I don't think people are sensible to this. Great points there. And I will also say that iCloud, Apple tried to encrypt iCloud in 2018. The FBI actually said, no, you're not allowed to encrypt your iCloud backups because uh, we need access to them. So Apple backed off. This was after the San Bernardino pushback. Excuse me. This was after the San Bernardino pushback where Apple stood its ground. It seems that they only had so much ground to stand on and the FBI kept pushing back against them uh, for the iCloud stuff. So they just kind of rolled over and said, we're not going to encrypt it. So yeah, that was the government not wanting your stuff to be protected. Since then, we've seen all number of hacks and uh, people getting access to people's iCloud backups and leaks and celebrity nude photos and whatever else. And that's because the government has intentionally weakened our systems and not allowed Apple to protect people, which is kind of really bad. Um, another tweet I want to highlight, John Di Pietron said, it's clear to me that they're not protecting its users' data, but rather hoarding it for their own forthcoming ad network. It's possible, but Apple's primary product is their devices. They're not an ad company. Google, in their entire business model is advertising, but Apple's is devices, and they actually sell their devices based on a privacy premise. On the other hand, I agree with you. They are collecting a huge amount of data, but they're not collecting as much as they could. Like, for example, Apple Maps deliberately puts a lot of your data outside of its reach. They use things like buzzing and obfuscate your route and you know 24 after you you search for a route on app they actually change it to a less specific location so they're not collecting as much data about you as they could so i still believe that apple does a tremendous amount for privacy uh, a lot of people don't trust them as much since all of the client side scanning debacle uh, came about they did step back from them but they lost a lot of people's trust when they started talking about that. So I can understand why people don't trust them anymore, but I still think they're incredibly valuable and are doing a lot to protect people's privacy, even if uh, they're not 
perfect and uh and shouldn't be considered like this fail safe um so just a, a few things to think about there i want to dive into quiz questions i i saw a bunch of you who are responding to all the quiz questions in the chat oh, i love it when you do that because it makes me it makes me feel good when you get the right answers too because i'm like yes we're we're pushing the privacy conversation forward we're on the same page so first question is when you're on vacation should you post your pics on social media B is the correct answer. You should do it not while you're away. You shouldn't be telling people in real time where you are. You shouldn't be posting things at the fair and saying, hey, I'm right here at the fair. It lets people know that you're not in your home. It lets people know where they can find you in real life. It's just not good privacy protocol. So probably don't post that stuff immediately. Maybe just wait a little bit and then you can post it and then people won't know your travel dates and where exactly you are. And it just puts you in a much safer position in this very interconnected digital world. Uh, then we had the question, which OS is considered the most private? Is it iOS, Android OS, or Graphene OS? So Graphene OS is really uh, across the board by security experts considered the most private operating system. Edward Snowden has tweeted about it and said that Graphene OS is by far the best for security. Uh, definitely something you guys should check out. I have a tutorial that will show you how to install it on your phone if you wanna give it a go at some stage. And then we've got the final question, what was the most private way to send a photo? And it is to actually send it through Signal because Signal strips all of the metadata from the photo when it sends it to the other person. So you don't have to worry if you're sending something to someone and it has your IP address of exactly where you took the photo. It, Signal gets rid of all of that. So it's a great way to just easily strip out metadata from photos. If you have Signal, if you want to post a picture on social media or whatever, or on your website or or something like that. You can actually send it to yourself on Signal. It'll strip all that metadata for you. And then when you can put that on the internet and it will be far less privacy invasive. Just a nice little, little hot tip for you. So we do have some winners to announce and uh, I'm gonna drum roll and invite uh, my producer, Sam, to announce while I dance to this amazing song. Always my pleasure. We are so excited. Our winner today, here we have it. YouTube viewer old school. YouTube viewer old school. You are the winner of today's privacy beat mm -hmm. contest. And you've achieved eternal privacy beat glory. Eternal privacy beat glory. So Sam, I would love you to tell me some absolutely not entirely made up facts about old school. What are some things that old school likes? I would love to share that information with you. Analog tape decks. Old school also appreciates and loves Saturday morning cartoons. And there you go. YouTube viewer old school also loves saying no when an app asks to track them. Congratulations, old school. Absolutely. Congratulations, old school. You are our crypto beat winner. I mean, our privacy beat winner, and you win eternal privacy beat glory. Everyone, that wraps up our Privacy Beat show today. If you like the show, please hit that like button. Before you leave, please hit that subscribe button. It really does help us bring you content and get that content seen. And tomorrow we're coming to you at our new showtime, temporary showtime. Uh, we will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. It's in daylight time. If you wanted to tune in for the Crypto Beat show, we go all, over all of the most important crypto news, hot tips for you, uh, different things that you need to be aware of as you reclaim your financial sovereignty. So make sure you tune into that and go have yourself a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Go and, and enjoy yourself. We will see you tomorrow. Bye.